The Gurkhas, one of the most famous regiments of the British Army, they fought across the globe for Britain in many, many wars. But how did these tough men from Nepal end up fighting for the British? That's the story we're going to answer today, and we're going to look at how they came of age on Delhi Ridge during the Indian Mutiny of 1857. It's an absolutely amazing story, and one I think you're really going to enjoy. This is the place for people who love British military history. As regulars of the show will know, I'm deep into my new season all about the Indian Mutiny of 1857-58. It was a brutal, controversial war, known in India now as the First War of Independence. Today I'm joined by friend of the show, Josh Proven. He's at Land of History on Twitter. I started off by asking Josh the obvious question, how did the Gurkhas end up fighting for the British in the first place? The founding story of the of the Gurkha Brigade is one told very well, in fact, by Colonel Sergeant Kailash Limbu in his book, Gurkha, uh, Better to Die Than Live a Coward. Uh, I recommend you uh, read that. This story that he tells so well uh, is the story of Frederick Young, who joined the EIC in 1801 at the age of 15, uh, passing the, the board of shipping or transport, as it was called, uh, with the with the piercing uh, interview questions of how old are you, and are you willing to die for your country, having answered honestly in the first and uh, in the affirmative in the second, they gave him uh, an appointment to ship off, and that was that was how you got your commission in the East India uh, Army. Um, now he was indeed willing to die for his country. He proved that when during the uh, Anglo-Nepal War, uh, which uh, broke out in 1815, he found himself confronted by the Gurkhas uh, and his sepoys, uh, who were already in terror of these people, uh, fled, fled the ambush, leaving him pretty much alone to, uh, to face the enemy. He did so and was captured, and the Gurkhas asked him, why didn't you run away like the others? And he said, I didn't come all this way just to run away. And that struck to the heart of what the Gurkhas felt a, a fighting man should be. And, and some of them apparently even uh, observed that uh, we, we, could, we could serve under an officer like that, you know, this, this, this is good, this is, this is a good soldier. Um, so Im immediately there was this respect, and indeed uh, across the army and the columns that went into Nepal to try and sub subdue them, the Gurkha Empire state, um, they quickly found out that they were dealing with very, very tough fighters, and that this was not going to be easy at all, and it wasn't. The Nepal War was, a, was a, an incredibly difficult um, conflict for the British, and indeed they only just managed to get the upper hand uh, and threaten Kathmandu. They never took it. And that's a very important part. Um, they, 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 they had a, very, a quite generous treaty with the Nepalese. And because Young was so impressed with the Gurkhas when he was a POW, when he got out, he immediately asked permission if he could raise uh, Nepalese, a Nepalese local battalion, as they called them, to um, to to command himself, and he was granted permission, and that is the that is the that is the first Gurkha regiment in the. They were formed from the disbanded remnants of the old Gurkha army, the Nepalese army, which had to be reformed, and that is the nucleus of the of the Gurkhas, eighteen fifteen, eighteen sixteen. Brilliant. And were they at that point when they were first formed, were they part of the Bengal Presidency's East India Company Army or were they were somehow separate? Do you know? Yes, the, uh, it's a bit of both. Um, the Bengal Presidency's Army did have direct control over them. Technically, they were on the establishment of the Bengal Army, but at the same time, they weren't. Because they were what they were was known as a local battalion, they were not part of the, the, the line of battle, and they were not referred to as native infantry. So you would have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Bengal native infantry. The Gurkhas 
were known by their by their where they were raised so for instance frederick frederick young raised the first regiment at Seymour, um and so they became the first in in brackets Seymour local battalion of bengal sort of something <laughs> a complicated quite, title yeah something like that uh, so they were distinct they were more like auxiliaries Brilliant. Well, let's fast forward to our focus today then, which is 1857. We've got a bit of background. We know where these units are from and, and how they came about. But 1857, as we know, as I'm currently covering on my season about the Indian mutiny, the Bengal army mutinied, but the Gurkhas didn't. Can you give us a sense of why they felt they were different and why they didn't mutiny when most of the Bengal army units did? Yeah, I think I can. Um, the well, first of all, we know that they're not technically native infantry. Not only do the Gurkhas know this, but the the Bengal sepoys uh, sepoys know this, and they are not shy about showing it either. It's a very much a a, symbi a symbiotic, if that's the right word, relationship of difference here. So you already have that. Then you add to that the fact that the the Highlanders of Nepal have very little in common with the the plainsmen of the Bengal uh, air, of Bengal and Hindus, wider Hindustan. In fact, if anything, they're the enemies of the plain. They they don't look like the people down there. They don't think like them. They have different ways of doing things. They despise them as uh, each despises the other as lesser. So there's a hefty bit of racism here from the Himalayas down and back up. The the Gurkhas quickly, due to this sort of exceptionalism that was just inherent in the in how they how they all how they were organized, um, fostered a very strong regimental identity through traditions through 40 years from 1815 to 1857-ish, I believe, um, of service. And they, they, I mean, they didn't, they referred to the, they referred to the Bengal army as the Kalalog, which means black people, or the Purbayas, which means people from the East, I believe. Um, and these were distinctive separate separating terms to show that we're not like them. Uh, in fact, it got to a point by the Sikh wars in the 1840s that uh, the European officers of the Gurkhas, uh, who are still local battalions, took pride in the fact they did not have NI after the regimental designation and would be insulted if they were ever called native infantry. It was a matter of regimental pride that we're Gurkhas, we're not native infantry. They request now and again to be encamped nearer the British, and when the when the when the cartridge crisis occurred, for instance, they they went out of their way. I think on one occasion, at least, so regimental tradition states that they they return because the cartridge. Remember, the cartridge situation was resolved, and they issued new cartridges. But the Gurkhas gave back the reissued new cartridges and asked for the tainted ones back to show that they didn't have a problem in the first place with any cartridge they were given to use. They thought it was unsoldierly to be messing around with this. It's a cartridge, you fire it, it's, you know, it is what it is. And so when the mutiny came out, they had nothing in common with the Bengal sepoys. They had no, uh, unlike the rest of the army that was able to, through its messes and sort of through its own regimental systems, spread the word quite quickly and have these um, sort of um, mutiny sort of little governments like the ones uh, that Mangal Pandey used and things like that. Uh, the, they had no in with the Gurkhas. I mean, they didn't even speak the language, um, really. They would have to go through a different route and there was no and there was no door open to get the Gurkhas on their side. So the Gurkhas stayed with the British. However, actually, there was a Gurkha mutiny but it was about pay. It had nothing to do. It was about money, which is a much more common so common soldier's complaint. The the Nasiri battalion had not been paid, so they refused to obey their orders and then looted a treasury of about seven thousand rupees 
and they all had to be rounded up and arrested. Uh, only if only a few of the ringleaders were executed or punished, I believe. And then there was a report a little later saying that they were completely back to normal and nothing was wrong. And that, that was also at the same time, wasn't it, around May 1857? It was. It, that was very concerning to people, um, especially because it was up in the in the hills uh, where, where the Gurkhas were stationed. And um, yeah, they, they, they caused a panic when they when they sort of went on the rampage so to speak even though it was a very orderly mutiny it was because uh, the main show had re pretty much kicked off i believe and they were or just before when everything was uncertain about the cartridges so yeah it, it didn't it didn't help people to see them as 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 loyal soldiers that you could trust well, that's an interesting segue then to the battalion we're going to focus on today, which was the Simor Battalion. They were trusted and they ended up in the place of honour on Delhi Ridge as the British besieged the city they'd recently lost with a view to taking it back. Can you give us a sense of who were the Simor Battalion? Why were they more trusted perhaps than other locally raised units? And how did they end up at the place of honour on the ridge there at, at, at the key strategic location, which we'll talk about in a minute? The Sermoor Battalion is was the C, I believe, through a sequence of interesting events and how regiments are raised and disbanded and reformed and things like that. There were several Gurkha regiments, as I just alluded to. Um, the Sermoors were the oldest one, the one that Young first raised at Sermoor, and they had a very dis they had little distinctions that set them apart. Uh, such as the very famous red and black uh, dicing around the hat that the Siamuras used uh, right up until the formation of the current Gurkha Brigade. Uh, and it's still used within the brigade as a general sign of the Gurkhas, basically. They, um, why they were trusted more than in anybody else is difficult to say as well. It's possible because of the reputation that they already had as being good soldiers and because they had not shown any inclination to do anything except follow orders. That's probably a good indication because the British didn't have a lot of men, so they were probably willing to take a chance of, if you're going to use non-European soldiers, the Gurkhas, being as they're the only ones around as well, uh, for the most part, um, might not use them. There was a fair amount of them. They were commanded by uh, Major Charles Reed, uh, who were, and he uh, at Dera Dun, which is a famous uh, regimental depot. Uh, there are 490 of them in six companies, and they were close enough to respond. I think they they were they were summoned on. There was someone. Let me check here on the 15th of May, and they linked up with the Delhi Relief Force as they were marching on the ridge itself, I believe, uh, on the 30th of May. They got a very cool reception despite just by showing up because these are obviously what, the, what they were derived, they were derisively called native troops deliberately. They, there was native soldiers there, they called them, which is an insult to the Gurkhas at this time, as we've just seen. And whether it was the position of honor is, is open to question. Reed himself thought that he'd been basically thrown into the fire with his, as he liked to call them, little, little, little boys, um, because of the Gurkha's diminutive stature. Um, there's nothing diminutive about a Gurkha, but they are quite short. Um, and they, he thought basically he was being put there uh, because there were quite a lot of artillery batteries positioned around Hindu Rao's house. Now, I've just said the fair, I've just said that, so it means I need to double back a second. That position of honor it was called Hindu Rao's house. It was called the main picket, um, and it was a it was a mansion. I can describe the position a little later. I just wanted to explain what that was. Their position was at a large mansion called Hindu Rao's house on maps and just generally there. So he thought that they put him there so that they could blast it apart if the Gurkhas mutinied. Or just uh, or or they can prove themselves. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I, I suppose at this point, given what had happened in previous locations, the British were extra nervous around anyone who wasn't British. I think that's the case pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've, we've now mentioned Hindu Rao's house. I was lucky enough to visit there uh, a month or two ago. So the modern Hindu Rao hospital is built on the spot of the old Hindu Rao's house. Now, it's a big hospital, but as far as I can work out, this is the original structure, Hindu Rao's house itself. And it was here that there was heavy fighting. It's, it's within easy reach of the Kabul and Mori gates. And uh, once you have gone through the, the suburb and vegetable market of what was called Sabzi Manzi, uh, Manzi, I believe. And so it's actually one of the closest structures to the walls. And that's why it had to, it, it was made, made the main picket and why it became the focus of such um, determined attacks, because it, in a way, it became the key, if you took it and held it, then the batteries protecting it would probably have to be given up. That's the sort of the, re that's the relationship it has to the rest, of the, the rest of the ridge. And just for anyone who doesn't know, the, the British were in a strange situation, weren't they? They were besieging Delhi, but in fact, they were actually outnumbered in a, and in a way were besieged themselves. It was a very strange position to be in. What, it's what engineers, from the Woolwich trained engineers, would call an irregular siege. It's what you, and even the, it's the most irregular of irregular sieges, because they didn't even have the siege guns at the beginning <laughs> to even properly bombard the place. Usually, if it's even if it's a, an irregular siege, you want to take the place quickly. Therefore, it's assumed that you have the means to do so, and the British did not have the means to do so at the beginning. So what it, it, it became was sort of like a force of observation. The Delhi Field Force was what it was called because it's actually quite low numbers. And they just got uh, onto the ridge and decided, well, if we stay here long enough, we can get the guns up uh, and reinforcements up. And we can just make sure that we tie the, tie the rebels down. And that's the plan. That's what's happening here. So let's focus then on, on, our, on our guys from the Seymour Battalion. So they've, they've taken over this main picket up at Hindu Rao's house. What happens next? What was their first taste of battle and how did they perform? The, the first taste of battle was apparently on the, on the 9th of June, um, uh, very early in the morning. A lot of battles in India start quite early in the morning. A lot of marching happens before full daylight to be honest it used to be it's basically the tradition uh a large because it's so hot oh yes exactly anybody if 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 you know what you're doing you get your men you you stop marching actually before the uh, like in the early morning and you've marched mostly through the night and <laughs> in the dark hours um not always possible but that's 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 a good idea if you're doing if you're doing a lot of fighting or activity in india um, especially wearing those sorts of clothes. So um, a large enemy force came out of Delhi and they feed, they, they fed through the Sabzi Manzi and out onto the plain and tried to uh, assault the, the British position through the, the main picket at Hindu Rao's house. At that time, and the forces would fluctuate slightly as the siege went on, the Gurkhas had themselves and two companies with 60th rifles in support. And I believe two to three batteries of artillery were in relative proximity and could offer fire support to the position. So it's very strong. And so as well as having to sort of scramble uphill slightly, 60 feet is not a large elevation, but it's, it's, it's fairly prominent. And especially when you're being shot at. Uh, so Reed was aware that he was sort of being tested, his men were being tested, and he had had reason to believe that the Gurkhas would remain uh, under orders and under discipline because they'd, they'd been, there was this, this sort of trope during the Indian Mutiny that any non-European regiment would usually be approached by random mutineers and asked to defect the Gurkhas had a habit of just laughing at these people, which encouraged their British officers no end. Indeed, when called upon to now face a large enemy attack, 
the Gurkhas uh, repulsed it. And not only that, Reed decided to just show the field force what he could do, and then he and he chased them back into the walls. Um, up to this point, as we know, they'd been sort of like sneered at. Those are just those native infantry guys. We don't really trust them. But having seen this very assured display of prowess and um, superiority, when the Gurkhas returned to the camp, they were apparently cheered by the every every European regiment that they passed. Brilliant. So it was a great initiation, and it really proved them. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. And the mutineers, on one occasion, uh, and the many attacks they launched on Hindu Rao's house, uh, attempted to get the Gurkhas to switch sides. They they came over and said, "Gurkhas, Gurkhas, we're waiting for you. Come, come over to our side." Uh, I think there was. They tried to actually specifically give them incentives of of like various money, some some women, I believe, was one of the offers at one point. And you know, they were they were encouraged to hear the Gurkhas reply, yes, we're, we're coming. Now that's a terrifying thing to hear a Gurkha say, actually, if um you know that the Gurkha war cry is Ayo Gurkali, which means the Gurkhas are coming. And they came it's over a bit of double meaning. A bit of a yeah, double meaning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, and if the, if this ever gets made into a movie, that should absolutely be <laughs> in there. But yes, the Gurkhas came over, and um, the uh, they 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 did not they did not switch sides. They they opened fire and chased the, the mutineers back back into the safety of Delhi. Are there any other interesting stories or anecdotes from the siege that you want to share? Anything else from your research that you found interesting? So you have things like uh, 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 met examples of great stolidity and discipline under pressure. It was like a kiln at Hindu Rao's house. And the constant artillery bombardment from the walls meant the dust was constantly circulating in the air. And the diff it was difficult to get rid of the dead. And so you have even more problems about disease and the stench apparently up there was awful and flies were basically swarming around in large clouds all the time. So it was an awful place to be in. And the Gurkhas uh, took it very stolidly. They took it very professionally uh, and with good humor as the Gurkhas are famous for. And uh, there's an example of an artillery round smashing through the house and killing one of the sentries or both of the sentries who were on duty. And at that time, the one round even hit the colors because the Gurkhas carried colors at that time um, and, and snapped the staff. Uh, after all the, all the confusion died down, it was just complete order as the NCOs just took control and a, cor and a corporal apparently just sort of wandered, uh, just sort of strolled coolly across the, the destroyed rubble and things like that and reposted his sentry without really observing anything wrong. Uh, stories like that are quite common. As well as discipline, you have a, a, a very good example of the, the fighting spirit. So the, they're also plagued by snipers because guys from the city could sort of work their way at it through the buildings of the vegetable market at Sabzi Munzi and sort of take their time, get their targets, see if they can focus on windows and things like that, pick off sentries. And there was one guy who was really bothering the Gurkhas one day. And so two of the, two, two Gurkha sepoys um, sort of just decided, let's go get him. And so they worked their way very, very uh, stealthily up to the position where he was in, got on either side of the aperture where he was um, shooting from. And the next time he stuck his head out to fire, one of them brought down a cookery on his head and beheaded him. Classic. Classic That's Gurkha the, move. That's the move, yes. <laughs> there was a lot of that going on during the Siege of Delhi. It's stuff like that. Which give, uh, which reinforce the their their willingness to fight, the and their need as well to be kept under control because they were proper fighters. They they wanted to get in as well as being disciplined and and, and close hand to hand. Reed uh, wrote about one instance where there was a large attack coming in 
and he was holding his men back. And one of one of them said, pleaded, came, crawled up to him and pleaded with him to let them go and and fight, because he said that the the rebels thought they were frightened of the, that the Gurkhas were frightened. You've got to let us go. And Reed uh, sort of used this to ex exemplify what a Gurkha officer is supposed to do, and that is to remain is just to remain very pleasant, very calm, very polite. Don't order, you know, this is, a, I believe this was quite a low ranking sepoy who came up to him to ask him this question. And he just turned around and said, no, no, not yet. I'll let you go presently. And he was completely satisfied with that and went back to his place in the line. And then indeed they went forward and, and were able to attack. And this isn't a way that people dealt with their troops, uh, especially um, non-European troops. No, 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 no troops were tr treated like this. <laughs> um in in that manner but it was known that you had to you had to treat the Gurkhas differently to get to get the best out of them for the for the for the regiment you mentioned there was two companies of the 60th rifles up on the ridge alongside them now the 60th in the peninsula war has been well covered on this channel not done much during the victorian era but can you give us a sense of how these two regiments bonded and and how how that became visible yeah, uh, the, first of all, I think there was an initial sort of taking to each other after the initial engagements and, you, and everybody figured out who, could they, who, who they could trust, especially with the rifles, because uh, the Gurkhas were already wearing green at this point. So there's an initial sort of an affinity there. They look like riflemen, they act like riflemen, they, they don't fight, they're sort of irregular troops. They, they're good for, for the work that line troops aren't necessarily associated with. Um, I think by the end of the the siege, there was m much more than two companies. They were initially reinforced by another two, so there was four for the majority of it, at least, and another uh, unit from the Corps of Guides. Um, and the the sixtieth and the Gurkhas were up there in this really difficult position, this really awful, and under these awful conditions, being attacked as 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 Reed said, morning, noon, and night. Um, under constant bombardment, disease, stench, it's, um, sharing that those sharing those hardships uh, m makes for strong bonds, and the sixtieth soon became very friendly with the Gurkhas and vice versa. The Siamoers, we should be saying at this point, Siamoer battalions, uh, battalion, and the the you know the the sixtieth started referring to them as um our Gurkhas, the, the them Gurkhas of ours and the and the and the Samoas re responded by saying that they're, they're our riflemen and there was a sort of they called it apparently they started calling each other brother and things like that so they became very close up there and it's part of regimental tradition that after the bat after the siege they become so close that the Gurkhas the Samoas at that time requested to have, um, because they were designated Gurkha rifles shortly after Delhi, um, red piping to go on their uniforms, like the 60th had, as a, as a, as a, and, and, and it's, it was such, it's such a, such a, a sort of a, a nice thing from the old army, you might call it. This was how regiments used to sort of acknowledge each other uh, after going through an event like that. We'd like to wear some of your color. The Gurkhas called it Lali, um, the red that runs through the uniform. And Peter Duffel talks about the continuing stitch of Lali that connects the Siamos of those days to the Gurkhas of today and indeed the rifle brigade of today from back then as well. So I just want to wrap up, Josh, by asking, would you say this is where the Gurkhas really came of age, where they went from being, you know, just another locally raised unit to now being a unit that was on par, considered on par with many within the British Army, that bond that still goes on today. Was this the coming of age of the Gurkhas? In many ways it was, but it's still part of a process, I think. Um, this is definitely, re this is really where the Gurkha legend begins. This is when indeed the British, because this was when the British started seeing 
everything differently in India. This is this is where they started. This is the era, the beginning of the era, 1857 to this is the end of the East India Company. This is the end of that. This is the beginning of the Raj proper. And this is when all the traditions that we cl most closely associate with the British in India really start to occur. Such uh, And this includes the famous fighting units of the Indian army, such as the Bengal Lances, for instance, the Sikh regiments, the, the Rajput regiments, all those specific, what they called the, 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 the martial classes or something like that. That's where this really comes into play. And the Gurkhas were definitely, were absolutely one of them. Their performance during the siege of Delhi through the Indian mutiny really impressed the British. It struck a chord in, in that they had stayed on the British side. And thereafter, they become ever more present in a sort of a conscious imagination as part of the Indian army. But at the same time, in a strange way, still separate still in a way more or uh, almost like British infantry rather than um um rather than uh in quotes Indian infantry because you know it, they couldn't be Indian infantry they were Nepalese infantry Nepal was its own place so that was all right that was very proper that it should be that way and the coming of age uh arc was still happening. It continue. It would continue over the next hundred years. It would continue to the Dardanelles and Gallipoli, where they were brought in to because the British commanders didn't know if they could trust their Mus unfairly didn't know if they could trust their Muslim troops to fight the Turkish, and the Gurkhas fought. The Gurkhas of this tradition fought on because yeah, it wasn't the same regiments, uh, fought on in 1915 as they had in 1815 defending their homeland and as they had done in 1857 defending Delhi Ridge. So thanks to Josh for that. I thought that was brilliant. I hope you also found it fascinating. Make sure you subscribe, guys, because in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be walking the battlefield of Delhi once more. I'm going to be following in the footsteps of the men who stormed the walls who went through those gates in September 1857. Amongst them, of course, were the Gurkhas. In that attack, Major Reed was badly wounded, but his life was saved by his orderly, one of those hardy Gurkhas, Lal Singh Tapa. Also in the next episode, I'll be walking in the footsteps of John Nicholson, that fascinating but controversial character who we discussed in the previous episode, and I'll also be visiting his grave, so you will want to see and hear that. So make sure you subscribe, guys, leave a comment, leave a review, and do consider signing up for my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com. When you do that, you get a free copy of my book all about the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879.